problematic, Ellen. All right, welcome everyone to one more page, the virtual space. Uh, my name is Amanda. I'm your host for this afternoon slash evening, depending on what time zone across the world you are in. And we are here to celebrate um, the amazing Mariki Nijkamp and their new book, At the End of Everything, in conversation with Samira Ahmed. So welcome, both of you. Hi. Thank you. Hi. And look at you passing. It looks like you're passing books back and forth. Right? <laughs> there there. Wait, now hold yeah, yours wait. up. Yeah, wait. Okay, ready? I'm going <laughs> to really give it test you. You hold it. Oh, no, you go. Okay, ready? Oh, wait, you... yeah, oh <laughs> we're good. I can't believe this Hollywood is isn't calling us for to All do right, special you effects. Permanent residents of one more page now. It, I don't make the rules. You're coming back for every event to do this. <laughs> Um, so I will get out of all of your hair very shortly because I know you are not here to listen to me, but I would like to introduce our wonderful authors first, if that's okay with both of you. Sounds perfect. Okay, we'll start with the guest of honor today, our book launcher extraordinaire, Marie Kanaikamp, um, is the number one New York Times bestselling author of This Is Where It Ends and Before I Let Go, and now, of course, at the end of everything. Uh, they are a storyteller, dreamer, globetrotter, geek. They hold degrees in philosophy, history, and medieval studies. Um, a very, you know, a very short. Oh, it's such a light, light sense of light topic, topics, you know. Yeah, very <laughs> yeah, Exactly. Um, they've served as an executive member of We Need Diverse Books and is the founder of Diversify YA. I actually don't know how to say it out loud, but I can see it in my head. Diversify YA. Yeah, that totally works. Yeah, uh, they live in the Netherlands. And then they are in conversation with the amazing Samira Ahmed, uh, who is the New York Times bestselling author of, among other things, Love, Hate, and Other Filters, Interment, some amazing comics that you may have heard about. Uh, she was born in Bombay, India, and has lived in New York, Chicago, Kauai, and has spent a year searching for the perfect mango, which we could do a whole other event about. Just that, <laughs> oh, yeah. Yes. Um, and she currently resides in the Midwest. So welcome, Mariki and Samira. Thanks so much for joining us today. Thanks, Amanda. Thank Thanks you. so much for having us. We're so excited to celebrate with Indie Bookstores. So excited. Yes, we're excited to have you. Um, so just some housekeeping for everyone watching. I'm going to dip out, but I'll keep be keeping an eye on the comments. So if you have any questions for Samira and Marike, um, I, they'll be answering questions at the end of the session. So feel free to pop them in. I'll keep an eye on them or save them for the end. Whatever follow, you know, whatever your heart feels like is the right decision for you at the moment. Just go with it um, and enjoy. Y'all good? We're awesome. Perfect. All right. See you on the other side. Awesome. Hi. Hi, my friend. Hi. So happy pub week and also happy Thank belated you. birthday. Yep. It's been a busy week. <laughs> yeah. I'm I'm um, mostly running on coffee at this point. I'm just like, I have no idea what day it is, but I'm enjoying all the festivities and all the cake. All the cake specifically. Um, all the cake is how life should be enjoyed on the regular, <laughs> yep. I feel exactly. like. And you and I have shared various pastries in more than one country and in multiple yes. states, yes. might I add. <laughs> that's partially why I'm so excited to be here because I also get to see you. Yeah. When yep. was the last time we saw each other in person? January uh, 2019 at ALA Midwinter. Is that right? In Philadelphia? 2020. 2020, yeah, like, 2020, yeah. It was literally like a few weeks before the whole world shut down. Didn't we have like, we had breakfast together. Yeah. Oh, that yeah. was nice. It was, I miss it you. So good. It was like literally, I think it was exactly two years ago to the date. Because I oh my know gosh, I you know what I think you're on right. my birthday. So it was it was pretty much exactly two years ago. Oh my ago gosh, to the date. it's been so long. Oh, well, yeah, I miss hanging out. We with met person. each other at another conference, which of course because we're authors. Yes. But we had our we had our meet cute. I love my meet cute with cutes with my author friends at BEA BookCon. Yeah, I was about to say, like, it was it was still BEA at that point. Like, was that before it changed to Book Expo? In my mind, oh, right. it's, oh, right. it's, it's, right. always it's always been BEA, but I think we, it was still... We met each other there um, because you were so kind. as Because my book, had, my my debut had not even come out yet. Nope. Love, Hate, and Other Filters nope. was coming out. And that was, like, the first time we were giving away arcs. And I was like, very <laughs> starry-eyed because you were like, oh, I would like an arc. And I was like, oh, my God, a famous author wants my book. <laughs> But also, I really wanted that arc. <laughs> um, so I am so excited to just talk to you about this. And But let's just start with, how are you doing besides all the cake? It's been two pandemic years plus. 
Yeah, um, and, and like a pandemic year counts as like 10 regular years, right? Yeah, exactly. That's how that goes. Right. It's like dog human years, right? Yeah. So oh, how are you yeah. doing? I mean, aside from having an awesome new hair color. Um, yeah, we'll have to like find ways to deal with the fact it's it's so much longer now because I haven't been like I haven't had a haircut. I've had like two haircuts over the last two years. I mean, same. Um, I know my hair is so long. It's, it's like Rapunzel it's so situation. Weird. Yeah, like I could at least I can do the undercut myself. That part is fine, but this is just like keeps growing longer and longer and longer. I love the sa but I love the sapphire ness. The, the... It's, yeah, I'm, I'm I'm pretty chuffed with how this came out. Um, but yeah, no, it's it's just been such a weird time. Um, I don't I I honestly don't know <laughs> anymore. I didn't really think like very naively didn't really think that I would be launching this book in the. I don't know how many is wave of of like a new variant of COVID and new like soaring pandemic cases. So that's um, you know great. Um, yeah, <laughs> well, I'm Good never trying this on a really like hopeful, lighthearted note, everyone. Um, but we will get to sorry hope and that. light. We will get no. Don't say sorry. <laughs> Listen. So, but since we're talking about somewhat. Um, bleak things or things that are initially confusing to us. Give us first, give us like the thumbnail sketch, give us the elevator pitch for yep. At the End of Everything. Okay, so At the End of Everything is about a group of teens in a juvenile correctional facility who uh, one night wake up to find their guards have abandoned them and when they try to break out, which is what you would do in that situation, um, discover that basically the whole world is uh, has locked down because there is a deadly virus, well, plague roaming the land and everyone is is uh, confined to their homes, their their uh, residences, and in their case, like the juvenile correctional facility. Um, and they're abandoned, they're left alone and have to find ways to survive while food is running out and the plague breaches their walls too. And um, they have to find ways to learn to trust each other and uh, get through it together. So it's a fun, happy book is what I'm saying. Um, it, feels, <laughs> it, feels, it feels a little ripped from the headlines. Yeah. Uh, talk <laughs> about, can you tell us a little bit about how this came about? I mean, because it's a pandemic book and the yeah. pandemic. Um, and um, when did you start writing it? When did you first get the idea? Give us a little sense of that because I know just as a reader, like very or like in sh the first few pages, there's a time where a guard coughs. Yeah. <laughs> and if you read that, I think anybody like my initial reaction was like, oh, like you know, you like hold your breath and like you're suddenly like, I got to wear my mask because this yeah. guard inside this book is coughing. Yeah. So I'm just experiencing that as a reader. Talk a little bit about what it was like as a writer. And also just when did you start writing this? Because that's. Yeah. It's uh, like the weird thing is I was just I, I started binging this new series on, on Disney Plus and someone had like um, strep, I think. And I was just watching that going like, oh, God, it's COVID. What's happening? I was like, oh, no, wait, this, this series is like 10 years old. This makes no sense whatsoever. But that's just so com like, like so completely my frame of reference now. Um, I don't think that's healthy per se, but there we are. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, no, I, I started, I started writing this book. I started, well, started talking about this book with my, um, editor and agent, I think shortly after coming home from, from ALA in, in Philadelphia. So like January, February, 2020, um, when obviously like COVID existed, we knew that there right. were outbreaks in, in China and, and outbreaks were slowly occurring in Italy and Europe and and um, but it wasn't like the whole world hadn't shut down yet it wasn't a pandemic yet that we didn't know it was going to be um and I've always been fascinated by pandemics um oh <laughs> which is so hard to admit now and it's it's genuinely I wish that that was still some kind of theoretical fascination um don't necessarily enjoy the whole living through one aspects as such, <laughs> but I like like I I studied medieval history, so I read a lot about the plague, um, and that's always been one of those questions in the back of my mind when when reading like, sources about the plague has been. So, what would it feel like to live through situations like that? Um, 
I like watching disaster movies as much as the next person. So obviously I have all I have watched like Outbreak and Contagion and, and movies like that too. And Which by the way were this... really everybody was what was like streaming those again at the start yeah. of like lockdown. <laughs> but why though? <laughs> I mean I yeah. think... I think especially in the beginning, I mean, none of us had any idea. Everybody was like, maybe it's going to be two weeks or a month. Yeah. Yeah. We 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 were so naive and innocent. We had no idea. I know. No I know. Idea. But, well, since you mentioned medieval plagues, um, why don't you do a little comparison for us? Because obviously that influenced... <laughs> That influenced your that influenced yeah. your book because you actually have like the historical yeah. knowledge to because you said earlier fights will break out because that is what happens yeah and um you know we can we can see this sort of uh this rising aggression um, just yeah. societally right now at least in the U S I'm not sure how I don't know about what's going on in the Netherlands in Europe it's just not people just don't have as many guns. As you know, that, that is definitely an upside. Um, people still have many conspiracy theories and, and generally bad ideas. Um, but the not having guns is definitely an upside. Yeah, definitely. Uh, yeah, because, uh, I mean, right, because we haven't gotten to the, luckily, we're not to the point of, um, you know, like I just watched Station Eleven, mm -hmm. another pandemic movie, which, yeah. by the way, when it first started shooting was filming on my block in January oh, wow. and then they moved it out of <laughs> wow. Chicago and I was like oh my god they're filming a pandemic movie four houses down at my neighbor's house oh, wow. <laughs> um Yikes. but yeah but there is that sort of there is that sort of we all have you know each person for himself or maybe for your yeah. friend in the pod talk a little bit about how your your study of that influenced your writing and how we can see it in the book yeah I mean it, I it's it's uh, it's it's definitely something that I think just happens at um, times like these, like times of crisis, times of mass trauma. Um, people long for a sense of control, and and one of the things that helps us like find control is having someone to blame. Um, having like that's that's one of the reasons I think why conspiracy theories are are so popular. It's easier to think that something or someone is doing this than that it's just bad luck and it happens, um, and you know shit happens. That that that's a lot harder to deal with psychologically because there's no nothing to do about that. Um, and I think that that's something, at least to some extent, that uh, at least. Um, and and I should say, like medieval plagues aren't my area of specialty um, or my area of expertise, but I I like have read about them, um, and it's it's hard to study the Middle Ages without at least coming across yeah, exactly. some plague information. <laughs> um, but yeah, one of the things that I that's been really I don't, I don't know if interesting is the right word it, it really isn't but also one of the things that i see that that feels very familiar is um like when the plague occurred in in the middle ages um or the plague as we know it like the 14th century plague that we usually refer to there have been more um uh, one of the things that that you saw was anti-semitism mm -hmm. like rose intensely because like I said, people wanted to have someone to blame. Um, and I think that that's, that's at least to some extent comparable to um, um, uh, anti-Asian hate mm -hmm. that you, you see as a result of COVID now. Um, and I think that that's one of, the, one of the things I tried to do in the book specifically was focus on like the human aspects and humanity that can help us through situations mm -hmm. like these and that can help us survive uh, a plague. But but I definitely did want to ignore that there are many harder aspects to it too. Um, mm -hmm. And and one of, the, one of, I think one of the main ones is, is just how easily it leads people to hate or at the very least, um, God, what's the word I'm looking for? Scapegoat? Yeah, no, scapegoat is not quite it, but uh, I don't know, I'm blanking. Um, at least, uh, 
worry about anything and anyone that's that's other mm -hmm. whatever mm -hmm. other means but i think that that's one of the one of the main things that you see happened throughout history and unfortunately you see happen now and and um it's something that happens in the book as well um mm -hmm. it's it's it, this is a group of teens who are abandoned by the world both like literally but also in the before times they're they're just they're seen as as delinquents and nothing more than that their humanity mm -hmm. is completely stripped from who they are um and i think that 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 may be more than than like a plague or a virus itself i think that may be one of the biggest threats to who we are in times of mm -hmm. crisis um, I think I, I think that's so interesting because um, I, I'm going to quickly touch on three points. So then you you speak to them how you think because <laughs> um, there is like this doubling sort of in the book. So there's the double abandonment, right? So yeah. initially being abandoned or disregarded, forgotten about, um, as they're placed into you know this detention center, um, some by their parents, like just yeah, you know who are like. Mm, you're nope. out, you know, out of mind, out of sight, out of mind, I'll get out of here. Um, yeah. But then, but then when one day, like none of the guards arrive and then there's like soldiers outside and then they're completely abandoned by the rest of society. Who's like, we're not taking care of these, yeah. these young people. Like, fairly um, physically cut off from everything and everything. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And it's like this, you know, it's like almost this double like confinement. I mean, yeah. they're, you know, so I, I, I thought that was really interesting because they're dealing, it's traumatizing on multiple levels. Yeah. And there's also, but you also talk a little bit about, you also talk, there's also this element of hope. And in some of your books, we, I mean, it's in all of your books, but also in this one, there's this element of found family. Yeah. And I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about how, you know, how you both wanted to use this sort of the, the pandemic as a way, I mean, not that you're using it just as a metaphor, because it's not, <laughs> but it is also a metaphor. It is also a metaphor, for sure. Right. Yes. I mean, because it's literal, but it's also a metaphor yeah. for these kids who have been abandoned and people who have been abandoned in society and relegated to the margins. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Finding absolutely. each other. Yeah. Yeah, no, it, it's definitely like it, it's it's um, it, it's definitely not intended to be like just a metaphor. It is actually a book about plague as well. Um, but obviously, like the plague as as um, um, as a story device is there to explore what it means to be completely abandoned, what it means to be completely cut off from everyone else, um, and and basically left to die. Um, and and I think a lot of what's happening to these teens once they are left alone, left on their to their own devices, it is what has been happening to these teens in in like the before era um but not as explicitly um mm -hmm, mm -hmm, and, mm -hmm. and obviously having the plague there helps to show like the extremes of what happens when people are left alone um and and, and left abandoned and left um to basically told that they they don't matter they nobody cares about them and um you know just suit yourself um Right, because they're already mar they were already marginalized. Yeah. They're shoved to the margins, and then there's the additional abandonment. And you know, it's interesting because we're talking. I, I feel like right now in the zeitgeist, there is a lot of discussion about, or I mean, there's probably not enough on this, but people are trying to raise flags when they're like, "Look, when you're saying, when you are saying, I don't want to wear this mask, and I don't want to do, I'm not going to get the shot, and like whatever." There's, it's also deeply ableist because there are some people who literally cannot. Yeah. And what you're doing is like, I could get this. I could do this something for the common good. I'm like a, I'm really big on like, you know, participating in the social contract because sure. I, yeah. I, we have an obligation to each other. Yeah. Um, and you touch on a lot of those, a lot of those things too. What happens in the margins? Because this is a book about kids in the margins. Yeah, yeah, um, absolutely, and and it it's it is, it, in a sense, it's it's about building a society that is like, and and in this case, like a society of like two dozen teens, um, three dozen teens, but it's about building a trying to find like building a new contract, finding ways to to 
like have that sense of community and found family and and uh impossible times and mm -hmm. building something that is hopefully more equitable than what they're used to because they've all like all of them individually and all of them together have seen the worst of of humanity mm -hmm. um and and so like at, at the fairly, fairly at the start of the book a group of teens who are at hope decide to just like decide to leave it all behind and if they're supposed to stay there they're not going to they're just going to like try their luck in the wild and see what happens and then the group of teens the book follows are the ones who decide to stay in this this one place that they sort of know as home and see what they can do to make it better and see if they can learn to trust each other and see if they can if they can find ways to to strengthen each other and i think that that's um like 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 i said i didn't necessarily set out to to write like intense social commentary although that is always in the back of my mind too because i do think that this is maybe not to to this extreme but i think a lot of questions that my main characters struggle with are probably questions that a lot of teens and specifically marginalized teens struggle with in in mm -hmm. these times um so it is always in the back of my mind because i know that these conversations are being had and i want to do justice by my readers um but yeah it it, it, it that having that conversation very much turns it into a conversation about what what responsibility do we have towards each other and and what are the dangers of of pure um, individualism in times where you cannot be individual or you cannot just focus on the individual because we're all in this together um i, I love I, you're very wise <laughs> and I feel like we could listen to you talk for a really long time. I mean, I saw like Mike, I saw some comment in, who, which was like, appreciate Brinkia's br brilliance because you're combining like <laughs> your philosophy, your analytical. Oh, there we go. Here it is right here. Oh my. Uh, hi, Mike. <laughs> hi, Mike. <laughs> um, um, but as I was listening to you, I was like, yeah, hell yeah. Um, this is this is me just like having a philosophy degree and thinking too much about things. I don't know if it's brilliance or just like overthinking, but I do appreciate the words. <laughs> um, it's, it's not overthinking. I, I honestly feel like right now we're in an age where you can't. Um, I mean, look, there's some things we can overthink because we're writers, but I think in terms of of the social contract and what it means to build societies yeah. and the foundation upon which societies are built. Uh, yeah. at least in the United States, we do not think about it enough. Um, and yeah. no, you know, that, when that you, is definitely an issue here too. Um, it's really, uh, you know, it's been pretty disheartening. I'm sure, yeah. um, you've seen that too, but your stories are not all bleak at all. Nope. You always have a through line of hope of finding courage of a kind of resilience which thank you, <laughs> but also why, welcome. why is that, why is that, why is that important? How does that, why is it important to you? How does it find its way into your works? And you said something earlier about, you know, wanting to sort of do right by your readers. How, how yeah. does that play into it? Um, I mean, I, I think that's, that's the main reason why it's important to me. Um, I, I mean, I love a, a good Blake story as much as the next person on occasion um these days less so because the world itself is bleak enough um but i i don't know maybe like it's sometimes hard to commit to this but i do honestly believe that people are good at heart um most people most of the time but also honestly all people not all of the time, but a lot of the time. <laughs> um, and and I like that. That is the way I want to see the world. Um, and that's like I I need to have a sense of. I think both for myself, but also for the stories I tell. I want to believe in in the possibility that things will get better or can get better if we do the work for it like it won't happen on its own um which would be nice i think right most of us are pretty tired at this point yeah it would be nice if we could just all sit back and and be like okay so you know moral arc of the universe have fun 
go for it. Yeah. Um, but Make our lives I mean, a little bit easier, please. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> please. <laughs> Some of us um, want to take a nap. Um, oh, we want to sleep so badly. <laughs> I haven't slept. Yeah. Like, I was like, I haven't slept well in two years. Um, Pretty much. I, I was thinking about this too because I feel like, um, you know, Students for Democratic Society, this group like from the 60s, like in, yeah. in the US, like in the early days, they had this motto that was um, build, comma, not burn. Yeah. And I think a lot, I've been thinking a lot lately about just sort of our energy, our collective energy, and how it's so much harder it takes so much more energy to build than it does yeah. to burn things down and that's why you know when you're like we're all exhausted it's because we're trying to build a world yeah. that is inclusive we're trying to build a world where there's where that's equitable where there is social justice where we are a you know where yeah. those kids on the margins aren't on the margins <laughs> aren't on the margins are right are, exactly like, where there's allowed no... to be in the spotlights and allowed to be like, at the center of the universe for, for exactly change. the yeah. heroes of their own story yeah. um and 100%. um it just takes so much energy to do that and that's the way we're all exhausted all the time it's and for the other side and let's like let's face it there is a other side like yeah if you don't believe there are sides then like <laughs> I, I, yeah. I don't know what to tell you. I mean, you got to choose. Um, Absolutely. But it's so much Absolutely. easier just to, to like throw gasoline on something yeah. and try to build it, to, to burn it down. And your books are about building. Like yeah. your young people are facing the fire. Yeah. The people who want to burn it down, who want to silence them, who want to literally forget them. But your novels are about building that community. Yeah. Your novels have that like pulse of hope yeah i think too that that i think that that part of that too is is recognizing um like the people who came before uh in the sense that like a small part of it is because i'm a historian i have spent a lot of time just reading up on history and i don't know enough about anything um but i do know enough to see that People have fought their way through hard times before and have have um, have managed to make their worlds or their their little corners of the world better by doing the hard work that they did. And that in itself is, I think, uh, good to keep in mind. So like it, it, it occasionally feels like this struggle is without end and and without victory. Um, but people have fought before and have done amazing things and and will hopefully continue to do so will i believe continue to do so so there's this 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 awareness of like the broader history of people um of the world um but there's also this awareness of like i i'm queer i'm disabled i have seen what disabled communities did and are doing continue to do um to make the world better and to create safe spaces for each other, create places where people can grow and be themselves and, and thrive. And I have seen my queer communities um, live through pandemics before and, and too many of them obviously died, but people still managed to find ways to live through that and continue telling their stories and continue fighting for the right to exist as they are and um and i think that that's like that is an awareness that i have when i'm writing my books like i mm -hmm. obviously it's it's a whole different conversation and it's a whole different type of activism but it is still this sense of wanting to show people that we're out there and we're like you said allowed to be the heroes of stories we're allowed to and not just in stories that are about suffering or are about like the hardship of being whatever um but but stories that aren't about anything related specifically to identity but can just feature marginalized main characters um so i think it's very much that awareness of of knowing the people who came before me and and also trying to be aware of of the people who will come next that's good that is good. I love, um, 
<laughs> I'm just listening, like sort of memorized, mesmerized. I'm like, wait, I got to think of another question. But I love, I, you know, it's funny because um, the French have, um, uh, the French have this phrase, the French have a phrase for everything, but they have this, <laughs> <Pretty> much, <yes. laughs> they have this like idiom, which is, um, and people heureuse, uh, ne pas histoire. a happy people yeah. have no history. Yeah. And I always think that's interesting because I feel like that is just made for Americans because <laughs> we are totally <laughs> terrible at knowing yeah. our history or really having awareness of it. And here you're talking about bringing all the history that you have, not just merely from your studies, but really from where you live. Because yeah. um, in Europe, there's a much greater sense, and, and actually not just in Europe, like in, in so many places that I visited, there's a much greater sense of history, awareness of history, knowledge mm -hmm. of history. There's an understanding of that, you know, in American, um, history classrooms, you hear that phrase all the time. Those who don't know history are doomed to repeat it. I'm like, dude, <laughs> we are repeating it constantly, yeah. but I, I mean, I, I mean, you talked earlier yeah. about anti-Semitism. You, you talked about um, homophobia. You talked about ableism. You talked about um, terrible things happening to disabled people during pandemics, but also during the rise of fascism, um, yeah. which we've seen. And you've seen. I mean, you've perhaps not seen it on your front doorstep, but you know what I mean, like the European doorstep. And America sort of divorced yeah. from that a lot. I think. Um, yes, that's absolutely true. Um, I do think it's it's, it's Americans like read that. a history book. <laughs> um, I like it, it's also I think good, good to keep in mind that most of the time that's a very conscious choice. Um, yeah, both in terms of like the history that you're divorced from and the point where you think history starts. Um, but I also think it's good to keep in mind that I like I've I've had conversations like this before and. I do agree that we as Europeans are more aware of history, but we're also really good at ignoring um, the, the 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 shameful parts of our history, the racist yeah. parts of our history, the colonialism, the um, uh, our like specifically for for Dutch people, our role in in slavery and slave trade. Um, we're very good at ignoring that and, and focusing on those pieces, bits and pieces of our history that suit us and that suit the narrative that we want to tell about who we are as, as a country and as a people. Um, so I don't think that that's necessarily an American problem as such. Um, I think it is like one of the ways in which we, we're, we're sort of luckier is that we're constantly surrounded by reminders of, uh, of history. Um, and f from like recent, fairly recent history, uh, the, the Second World War specifically, there's there are many many reminders of that, um, but also longer term history, um, we just don't necessarily treat that as well as we should, and and yeah. don't necessarily treat that with the understanding of um, the choices we made that we would like to not repeat either. I mean, it's interesting because you just said you know. Uh, you're surrounded by recent history, such as World War II. In the United States, that's considered <laughs> old. No, I, I actually I actually think this is interesting because you yeah. and I have talked a lot. And also um, yeah. to all of our friends who are watching and everyone who's watching, I'm sorry that basically I'm just having this discussion with Enrique that I find fascinating. I'm hoping you all do too. <laughs> no, you I was know. like, let's just continue and we're gonna have like a little coffee class about this after because this is yep. so interesting is, to me. This is what you signed up for, and if not, you can, you know, you should still stay <laughs> because we're very interesting. <laughs> <laughs> I am so fascinated by this, um, just that sort of how how societies develop that worldview. Yeah. Um, but that's also related, this is still related to your book. It's yeah. not, we're not so far flung because how these young people define themselves is different than how society defines them. Yes. yes. And they're making active choices yeah. to subvert those like, you know, that, sh that shadow that's been cast upon them, the stigma that's been put upon them. And I think, I mean, I've I gotta believe that your like your research and history has like been is finding its way into that as, as they develop that. I mean, my my main area of expertise was storytelling um, in medieval times and how people use stories to you know create identity. Uh, so it definitely filters into 
the books I write to and and and, and it filters into this book as well. Um, and I think that 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 sort of balance and and um, yeah, that, that sort of balancing act between how people will see you and and who you want to be. And in this case, like these teens have the option to radically break from how people see them because you know there's no one left to to judge them. There's no mm -hmm. one left to have that opinion, um, which makes it somewhat easier to say, okay, this is this is who we are now, and this is how we're going to try to change. But you do see in the book too that it's a very active choice for pretty much all of these characters to try to learn to be different, to be more than the role that was thrust upon them. Um, and I think that that plays out in, in, in different ways for the different characters. For example, there's, there's Logan, um, one of the main characters who's a non-verbally autistic twin sister of the first girl in Hope who falls ill with the plague. Um, and she struggles with the people around her assume that she doesn't know anything, that she can't do anything because she does not communicate in a way that other people understand. Um, and, and I very specifically see, specifically say it as such because she does use a home sign language with her sister and she does communicate. There's just this, this, um, inability to translate what she is saying effectively to a language that the other people there understand. Um, so there's like, she's struggling with figuring out who other people expect her to be and who mm -hmm. she knows she is. Um, and that also means that at some point the other characters realize that they have to actively play a role in learning to communicate that you can't just mm -hmm. assume that people will find their own way to communicate and and um you know shape themselves to whatever is most comfortable to you you have to play an active role in that um so i think that that's a very like very obvious example of people having all these these preconceived notions about who she is because she does not speak Whereas who she actually is is completely different, um, but no one actually took the time to listen. Um, and I think that, that that plays a role for pretty much all of the characters in the book in different ways, whether it's Emerson who is kicked out because they're non-binary or Grace who deals with anger issues, but who really wants to be more than her anger. And her anger has, I think, very reasonable... Um, like there's there's a good reason why she's angry all the time, and mm -hmm. that's because no one heard her before. And and if you keep saying things and you keep asking things and no one listens, and being angry makes getting angry makes a lot of sense. Um, so it's definitely something that they all go through individually, and and that again too, like it's something that they go through as as a group. And mm -hmm. I think that that comes back through the book uh time and again because every time they do want to try to do something they're still seen as those delinquent scenes from hope as opposed to this group of teens fighting really hard to survive mm -hmm. so you uh, you brought up like about 17 different threads we should follow <laughs> but one i yep. want to talk about because uh I I, I want to talk about craft i also want to talk about more specifically about language because what you just said was about um, when things are sort of lost in translation, who can understand us, the power of communication, yeah. Yeah. and how those words, both the ones that we choose for ourselves and however we choose to communicate those, but also the ones that people are applying to us or mm -hmm. speaking at us are defining who we are. And this book is about identity and about the, uh, you yeah. know, so much of the identities that these individuals are creating for themselves. And um, so let's talk about language a little bit. Perfect. Um, because uh, English is not your first language. Nope. English is not my first language either. But Yay. I live in a. <laughs> I live in a obviously a English dominant um, country, and so English yeah. is definitely my dominant language now. Um, but I always have this theory that, um, I mean, language. I, I think we don't think enough about how the language we think in impacts. Yeah our worldview. Absolutely. Like, one thing that I think is so fascinating, I always think how, uh, you know, there's always that phrase, you are what you eat. I always think like you are what you speak. Absolutely, yes. Because um, 
like, you know, just the word, like, uh, just like the phrase, I am hungry. Okay. In English, I am like, so I'm going to just talk about like to be and to have, right? Yeah. In French, avoir, être. Um, yeah. And or the, so I am hungry. In French, it's je fin. I have hunger. Hunger is something that. Yeah being opposed upon me. And in Urdu, which is my first language, hunger is being attached to me. Hunger is attaching itself to me. Um, yeah. and those, you, it, it, uh, interestingly enough, the French and Urdu are closer than the English is in how that verb form is used. And I think it's so interesting because it defines, to me, so much of food culture Yes, absolutely. in those countries, absolutely. in this just one sentence. And you are somehow writing brilliant books in a language <laughs> that is not your not your first language, mm -hmm. um, but also how, so there's that whole thing of, of you know, how you're defining the characters in a language that is their language, but not necessarily your oh, primary mine. language. Yeah. Um, I'm curious about what language you think in and dream in and how that translates into how you write. Um, and also how you can get how you can write such wonderfully three-dimensional characters and you're doing it in multi POV, multiple POVs in a language that's not your own, like not your primary. I shouldn't say it's yeah. not your own because I, English <laughs> is your own, but not, you know, that's not yeah. your primary or not your first. It, yeah. I just yeah. asked you like 75 questions. Y'all, these are I'm, interesting I'm, questions though. <laughs> yeah, I would, I would like love to talk about this in depth, in like, minute detail because that would be so interesting um and and also by the way um in in dutch i am hungry is i have hunger uh, which is also which also uses to have um so i have hunger oh, um, oh interesting we are unfortunately not a very culinary country so <laughs> yeah it's 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 really like it is something that's in the back of my mind a lot um it's like I'm a full-time writer now and I have been for the last three years. Uh, but before that, I still had a part-time job working for local government. And, and there was definitely this, this constant switch going on between who I was as, uh, as a government employee who speaks Dutch, writes Dutch, writes like um, specifically like, like, like very administrative Dutch um, and, and the person I was as like a writer who speaks English, thinks in English, and, and writes in English. Um, and it, it, it felt it felt pretty confusing at times. Like there's a, I, if I take a step back and, and reflect on who I am in different languages, there are definitely nuanced changes between like mm. Dutch me and English me. And there are ways in which changes, like intonation changes. And I think that's, that is super interesting. Um, and, so when you say you yeah. think in English, is that just when you're writing or is it like when if you're like walking around pretty much all the time now, but that's like part of that, too, is, is just being being a full time writer. So what I do most of the day is is write or think about stories and everything these days and, and for the past, I don't know, I think 10 years or so, everything related to stories has been in English, mm -hmm. um, whether that is plotting or writing a book or talking about books in most situations because most of my like author friends are english um and and talking about publishing all of that is is like obviously english for me um so i i do think in english when i'm thinking about stories i dream in english when i'm when when i'm busy with specific books or plotting or anything like that um, but it it's like it still switches back and forth. So it's an it's an interesting balance. But having like that 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 singular focus when it comes to stories certainly helps. Yeah. Um, and it's become slightly harder again, I think, throughout the pandemic because I'm like obviously during during non pandemic times I would travel a lot too and and see mm -hmm. people. And there's still a difference. Like I love that the internet exists, and I love that we yeah. can have these conversations online. But there's still a difference between like immersing yourself in a culture and in language and and just like having this connection through uh, a screen. So um, mm -hmm. that, that definitely changed it a bit again too. Do, does your dreaming? Sorry, I'm just so I'm always so fascinated by this how language no, works in, in our brains. Same. Do you, so you dream in English, but do you sometimes also dream in Dutch? Like say like you're yeah. off, say like you're not a deadline. I, so yeah, you, no, I've, I've, I do have you have both ever languages in one dream? 
Uh, yes, I've also like weirdly dreamt in French and at some point Japanese, which was really confusing waking up because my Japanese is, is so ridiculously rusty these days. So it's like, yes, I perfectly understood what was happening in my dream, but waking up, I have no idea what was going on. That's, I, I mean, I, I dream pretty much all in English, except I will remember when I've dreamt with something in Urdu or a little bit yeah. in French. And it's always like, I'm always fascinated by which phrases I'm using in yeah. the other language. Cause I was like, that's, that's gotta be telling or symbolic in some way. Um, and know, for me, I, a yeah. lot of it, I mean, I don't know, for me a lot, when I use Urdu, a lot of it is related to food. Yes, in that my makes dreams. sense. That makes sense. Yeah. Yep. I, so, but I, I just, I don't know, I'm just, I'm just really in, in awe of you being able to write these incredible books in English when, I mean, it's a language that you completely mastered. Now, of course, like for most Americans, you know, the old joke, like, if you speak three languages, you're trilingual. If you speak two languages, you're bilingual. <laughs> you speak one language, you're American. Um, um, I think we don't, yeah. you know, I would love if everyone in, in America spoke multiple languages because everyone, I have been to the Netherlands more than once, every single person speaks <laughs> more than one language. You have to basically yep. because Dutch is not the most widely spoken language. Nope. No, um, I think I think to 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 speak to that too. I think one of the one of the ways in which, and I don't know how you feel about that. But one of the ways in which I find having like writing um, writing fiction in an acquired language is super helpful is that I've learned all the grammar rules. So oh yeah, I, mean, my, I don't like, know grammar at all. It's terrible. <laughs> your copy your copy editor probably likes you. <laughs> I, my copy editor tends to be fairly light because I do know the difference between lie and lay and things like that because at some point. In in high school, I learned all those rules, which is super helpful. <laughs> it's um, truly a language that has so many weird things in it. It makes no I'm, sense. Which I, it, it doesn't, right? I mean, oh. I remember when, one of my uncles was coming to visit me, and he's like, I, he's like, English is just, he's a, he was a poet, an Urdu poet, and he was like, English doesn't make any sense. He's like, even with names, why is Y E A T S Yates and K E A T S Keats? He's like, that doesn't make sense to me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and then point. you know, like I, and it's interesting because I was a teacher, and and I taught a lot of um, young people um, who were newly arrived in the U.S. and did not speak English, and they were like, "Why is G H? Why does G H even exist? Why is P H F?" Yep. I mean, there are there are fairly good reasons for why yes, specific there are there, there are reasons lesser combinations would... exist, but like also throughout history, English has just bastardized like most right. other languages in in like the vicinity. So there are also many absolutely not great reasons why certain combinations exist yeah. or why certain grammar rules exist. It just happens to be you know close at the time, so that's why we do it now. Yeah, exactly. It's just, I don't know, it is pretty fascinating, but I'm always like, listen, blame like the Angles, the Saxons, and the Jews. I can't, I don't. <laughs> also I don't the have... French. Just blame yeah. the French. Generally speaking, that's good life advice. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm going to bring in Germany too, because my, you know. Fair enough. Yep. <laughs> exactly. Um, okay, let's get to a few. Wait, I didn't get to ask you, like, I have like about 25 other questions left. Okay, we oh, do have. I'll have to do this again. <laughs> let's bounce around let's, a little bit here. Yep. Okay, here's an audience question. Um, how do you find ways to connect with how teens are really feeling and talking right now? Okay, great. This is actually still a continuation of what we were talking about. Yep. Um, I mean, I don't. <laughs> in, the <laughs> in the sense that I do find ways to connect to with how teens are feeling um, through like store the school visits and, and through listening to teens on, on various social media. Mm -hmm. um, and, and just like basically it's like listening is is generally the answer to that like listening to what they were having conversations about what they're worrying about what um and, and a lot of teens are super vocal on whether it's tiktok but even even twitter which is apparently for most of us old ones now um but you know. like, <laughs> there's still a lot of like a lot of amazing teens doing amazing advocacy on twitter or just having fandom opinions, all kinds of different things. Um, so you can listen to what's going on. But I think in general, and, and I don't know how you feel about it, but would like to know that too. But when it comes to like how teens are talking, um, I don't particularly know or understand most of the time. Like I do not speak TikTok. I 
will likely not learn how to speak TikTok. I appreciate that it exists and that like people have found this awesome community and, and way to connect to each other. Um, but when it comes to my books, I don't necessarily, like I focus on, on story more than trying to find the right language or like right slang, I guess. is, is Yeah. I, I mean, I, I, I also, I mean, I'm just way too old for TikTok. I mean, come on. Yeah. Like, it's got to be, I just feel like there like should this, be like, TikTok is officially the point where I started feeling old. And I'm just like, you know what? I'm okay with this. This is yours. Yeah. Have fun with it. I know. I exactly. love that let it the, exists and it's super creative. Let the kids creative, have it. But I'm not going to try. <laughs> let them all butt out. Um, yep. But I don't, yeah, I agree. I think like when, I think also if you try too hard to get like that vernacular or slang it's it's yeah. evident that you're trying yeah and, and that's and not usually good. Know that you're trying completely and yeah. uh and then also anyway it could be dated in like a month yeah <laughs> i mean <laughs> um so yeah, absolutely i mean I, I don't know and then you know occasionally there'll be random words that come back from... i i use like it, it's it's not this book, but I, in, in Hawkeye, I used a few, like there are a few references to memes and such. And occasionally there's just like, I know I went, I went for like the, the classic memes, the things that will hopefully survive at least a year or so, um, which makes them classic. And right. <laughs> but even at that point, you just go through and you're like, well, I can, I can talk about 30 to 50 wild hogs or whatever it was, but <laughs> Like the average 16 year old won't care anymore. And that's perfectly okay. Like the fact that we're so hung up on, on like memes and such probably says far more about us and, and I know. our like hello fellow kids. Um, I know, <laughs> right. I know. <laughs> Is this what the kids are doing these days? Yeah, I mean, exactly. I agree. I mean, I think, and, um, and, uh, look, you just are trying to tell the story in the best way you can, and yeah. kids know when you're talking down to them and when you're trying too yeah. hard. I mean, that's just the bottom line. Uh, they're yeah. they're, they're, they're yeah. way smarter than we are and smarter yeah. than most people give them credit for. So yeah. keep you that in mind. Respect your readers. You yeah, just exactly. Have to respect your readers. Um, you guys, so if there's questions out there in um, the virtual land, uh, any other questions, pop them in the comments. But since you brought up Hawkeye and Fanda, <laughs> and we are wearing our marvel <laughs> i for for the audience i changed like five minutes before the event started because i saw samira's wearing, wearing her also miss marvel shirt i was like well i'll have to dress the match now <laughs> i i love it i love it so can you talk a little bit about how awesome hawkeye is i mean can we just have like a two minute convo about comics just a couple minutes comics are so fun oh my god i love that we're both doing comics and i love i love that you're doing miss marvel because i've been dying to read more and like reading your take on it it's just so much fun oh my god it's I'm been so much fun to write it. Same, it with so kate, same with kate bishop and i love that it came out right around the same time as the show even though they're not related yeah. different universes yeah but i love how you write her attitude it's so it's been so fun to do and i don't like one of the things i love about comics too is that um like when i when i write books i get to i usually go pretty deep in like into character and and figuring out like the the, the all the depths and crevices of of a a certain character um and and obviously when you're writing comics you don't necessarily have that um that way of approaching characterization that way of approaching a story so you have to rely on voice and you have to rely on mannerisms and 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 just general attitudes and it's just kate is is so full of attitude and so full of snark and she's just been such a delight right i yeah i'm enjoying and, it a lot do you feel do you find that um it actually helps a little bit with dialogue yeah. Absolutely. Dialogue efficiency, I'm going to say, in, yes. in your novels. Because yes, you have to be absolutely. super efficient in a comic. Yeah. Um, yeah. And you also want to let a lot of the art speak for itself. Like, you don't want to, yeah. you know, talk over it. Um, but you have to say a lot in a few words. Yeah. So and occasionally it just dialogue? in no words at all. And that's... Right. Like, and just like sound I, effects. I love doing that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I wish you could... Sometimes I want to have like, you know, like SFX sound effects in my books now. Because I was like... Yes. 
this is so great if you could just say hunger. <laughs> yep, absolutely agree. Oh God, yeah, I would love that. Um, but yeah, no, I, I definitely, I, I, I like writing, writing comics and graphic novels has, has taught me so much about fiction and writing like prose fiction and writing prose has taught me so much about how to approach comics and graphic novels. And I love having both of those aspects because I think they, they strengthen each other. Um, and definitely like, like economy, like word economy and, and dialogue econ economy is, is such an important thing. Um, I yeah, I'm, Tell I'm me about it. Me, the overwriter. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> my <God>. editors. <laughs> one of our editors is on here now. I think Caitlin is on here. Caitlin, are you Hi, here? Um, I um, uh, yes. For overwriters such as what I do all the time, it really is. A, a, it's yeah. been an incredible learning process. So it's been just part of everything. So I think we're we're close to wrapping up. But can, I want you to tell us, everyone. At the end of everything, one more page of books has links in the comics. Please get this book. Um, but tell us a little bit about what's coming up next for you. Um, so I, there are still a few issues of Hawkeye coming out over the next couple of months, and that will hit paperback in I think May. June? No, May. Um, okay, May. You yes. just had the third issue three just came out. I think. Issue, issue three just came out. So right. I'm like one month ahead of of uh, the Miss Marvel schedule. I think. Um, so that's coming up. Um, there are a few things that I can't talk about yet. Um, there's, publishing working, secrets. Yes, publishing secrets. I'm I'm working on the next YA, which I also can't say much about yet because, but it's going to be super fun and super queer and and super, super fun and super queer is basically just redundant. Yes, exactly. <laughs> And, and you know, disastrous and angsty because I'm writing it. Um, and then I'm also you working do have a, a way. You do have a way of incorporating that. I know, right? I don't know what that says about me. I feel like we should maybe have one of these these therapy sessions and just talk about like, what the books we write say about the, the people we are. Well, I mean, I think um, if you are thinking about it, like, yeah, you write about disaster and angst and like really, really bad things happening. Um, uh, but you always, there's always, there's always hope because like yeah. you said, you want to believe yeah. and you try to believe because it's a choice yeah. in hope Absolutely. and that people are good. I mean, I think yeah, it's it's a struggle to, to do that, but I think it's awesome that you do and I, we can see it in your books. I'm really glad. Yeah, that, that just, that makes a lot to me. Uh, and I think it's important. Like having hope is important and hopefully being able to like use that to maybe extend kindness and, and generosity to other people is important. And like in the end, that's, it's not what storytelling is about. It isn't like, it's about finding our common humanity um, and, and showcasing aspects of like who we are and who we want to be and, and what is aspirational. So, you know, that's that's why I write books. That's absolutely brilliant. I love I love ending on that so much. Hi, Amanda. Yeah, I had to pop back in because I'm like, well, we can't possibly. I mean, that's what it, well, what else more? You can't top it. That's, yeah. Although I will say, the greatest gift you can give besides hope is also buying Smear and Mary Kay's books yes. from one more page yes. and giving them to your friends, family, enemies, whoever. Yes. Uh, I buy like a dozen copies of like each of our books. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, but this has been a absolutely fabulous event. Um, listening to the two of you talk is like going to like one of the university lecture series that I didn't sleep through, <laughs> like in the best possible way. You two are delightful, and we will have you back anytime. Um, yes, anything please. else from the two of you before we sign off? Any Samir? Anything you want to shout out? Um, Besides, okay, of course. <laughs> well, get this book. Um, wait a minute, here it is. Also, <laughs> well, I do have Hollow Fires. Is ooh, yes. Is, now I'm having this glare. Oh no, Hollow I Fires it. is. I, I know. It. Here, here you go. I'm handing it to you. <laughs> um, is my next YA that's coming out in May, and so one more excited. page you can pre-order. It's a thriller. Wait, it's a thriller. We finally have some crossover. In Yes, let's do that. Yep, I am so excited for Hollow Fires. It it looks amazing. Um, I'm just excited to see you one day in person again, my friend. I hope that That's will happen nice. soon. Yes, and and like eating lots of breakfast pastries. 
so many pastries. So people, many. People don't understand our ability to just oh, no. go hog wild on the pastry situation. Okay, well, that's actually what I'm gonna claim for, yes. for the next YA in-person event. You both come here, we have a full breakfast pastry spread and we just see see what happens to it. I love this. I'm in, I'm in. <laughs> Put right, it on the calendar. Friends. It's a date. We're going to do it. Uh, thank Perfect. you all again. If you want to check out more of One More Pages virtual events, our calendar is on our website. We do lots of fun things. Um, and we'll see you all in the next one. Have a great night, afternoon, evening, day, whatever it is you're doing. Bye. Bye, Bye my friends. Bye, friends.